So the uh, last of the topics we're going to talk about today um, is collaborative research. And um, uh, collaboration is very important in research. Um, you, I don't think today you can go to any of the websites for any of the funding agencies uh, and not see some announcement that you know, they are especially interested in funding interdisciplinary research. And more and more we're finding uh, that um, research papers involve uh, relatively large numbers of authors, uh, very often in multiple labs, multiple universities, uh, multiple countries sometimes, multiple disciplines. Uh, and those that interdisciplinary research uh, represents a great opportunity for science because now different scientists and different research groups with different complementary capabilities can do experiments that no one individual could do. You know, when I was a student, um, it was most scientific papers had two or three authors. More than, more than that was considered a little bit unusual. And now, uh, especially in in, in some of the more prestigious journals and especially in the more clinically relevant journals, um, it's very common to see lists of authors that are so long that many of the names appear in footnotes because there isn't room on the page to list all the authors uh, under the title. So um, it's much easier today than it was in, in when I was a student to collaborate. First of all, there's funding for collaboration. That right away makes it easier. Uh, and also, uh, it's much easier to communicate. You know, when, when, uh, when, uh, you know, if I wanted to communicate with someone far away, uh, when I was a student, I probably would have been writing them letters. Well, now we have email and you know, instant messaging and all kinds of snap tweets and stuff that people are doing that I don't do. But still, you can communicate very, very rapidly, even if you're relatively old-fashioned like I am and insist on full-length emails rather than Twitter, um, you know, it's, it's no problem for me to have a collaborator and exchange information uh, several times back and forth in the course of a day, uh, sending back and forth you know, data, experimental protocols, uh, photographs, uh, graphs and charts, you know, just the kind of ease of communication that didn't exist uh, even 15 years ago. Uh, also now, there are increasingly uh, industry academic collaborations. And those collaborations are very important. First of all, uh, if we are interested both in having, in having our basic science translated into clinical application and translational research is some, certainly one of the big buzzwords today uh, on the roadmap towards developing science. Um, you know, it, we're not going to get our new ideas out into patients without people in the pharmaceutical or biotechnology industries uh, getting involved in that research. And furthermore, in these tough fiscal times, we all certainly appreciate when some company with deep pockets comes and funds our research. So uh, there are a lot of opportunities uh, in collaboration that just wouldn't exist without it. But collaboration can also represent problems. Very often, different disciplines have different ways of working. Now, to some extent, that isn't really only different disciplines, but it may just be different people. Even thinking of the people in my own department, you know, I see some people are very formal and some people are less formal. Uh, some people are easy to communicate with and some people aren't. Some people prefer to speak to other people. Other people prefer to use written communication of one sort or another. So there are a lot of different differences both between individuals and certainly between different scientific disciplines and between the cultures um, in different schools and different countries or different parts of the country. And uh, that can mean that people have different expectations. Sometimes it's remarkable how different two apparently similar universities uh, can be. I'll give you an example that recently came to mind. Um, in, in our um, uh, ethical use of human subjects course, um, I give one of the lectures that I give is on the use of students as experimental subjects. 
and one of the areas of controversy has been using medical students as subjects for experiment for experimentation. Now, um, at Harvard uh, Medical School, it's been determined that that is probably a bad thing because those medical students may be under pressure from their professors when they are experimental subjects. And so, except in very, very minimally invasive st studies, um, general at Harvard, um, it is considered to be unethical to use medical students as subjects for biomedical research. Now, at another medical school, at Yale Medical School, not very far away and certainly a very similar place, it is official policy of the medical school to encourage the use of medical students as subjects in human research, both because who better than a medical student could understand the informed consent document in medical research, and furthermore, seeing medical research from the viewpoint of the patient may be an important part of the education of the young medical student who's interested in going into clinical research. So here are two schools that are only, I think, about 150 miles apart and very similar kinds of places which have totally different cultures. So if, if, if an investigator from Harvard and an investigator from Yale want to collaborate on a project involving medical students as human subjects, they've got a problem. So you see, and, and of course, when you get into even more different places, things if like a collaboration between someone in the United States and someone in Africa or someone in South America, you know, there may be all kinds of different regulations that then have to kind of mesh together. Another problem is the sharing of credit. Um, some lab, in some laboratories and disciplines, uh, it may be, uh, certainly in, in most of the biomedical sciences, it's, there are relatively strict rules that most of us follow on just who can be an author. And generally, unless a person has really been pretty intimately involved in the design of the experiment, the collection of data, the interpretation of that data, and the preparation of a manuscript, it's considered inappropriate to actually give them authorship. In some other disciplines, some of the mathematical sciences, well, maybe if that person was actively involved in a discussion at some point that led to the conclusion, well, that's really sufficient for authorship. So again, if, a if you're doing a project where you need a mathematician to work with you, that mathematician may want to include three authors who you've never heard of, and you don't understand why those three people should be there. So that's a potential problem. Again, there may be problems of publication and restrictions. So for example, if you are publishing uh, with uh, if you're an academic laboratory and you're publishing with an industrial laboratory, the industrial laboratory may have various restrictions on just what, when things can be published or if they can be published. And again, if there are any concerns about those issues, they should be brought up in advance of establishing the collaboration. You don't want to be working with someone for several years and as a student, let's say, this is going to be, this publication is going to be the one that's going to be the basis of your PhD, and then find out, oh, wait a minute, I'm not allowed to publish that work. That would be a big problem. So you, again, you want to have these discussions up front. As I've said, it used to be the case that universities didn't realize how much of a problem this was, but now more and more universities will require that you not give up the right to publish. Now, it's perfectly reasonable to delay publication in some cases. For example, once you've published something, you cannot patent it. So it's perfectly reasonable to say, well, we're going to delay publication for a month so we can write a patent application. And once the patent application has been submitted, then you could say now it's okay to, to write a paper. But once a patent application has been submitted, it can be between two and five years until the patent actually gets awarded it would be unreasonable, in my opinion, for anyone to delay publication until a patent gets awarded. Uh, however, someone from industry might not feel that way, and that's important to know in advance before you, uh, 
go into a project like that. Now, one thing that you have to do in any collaboration is you have to meet the legal and ethical requirements of all authors, institutions, disciplines, and localities. So for example, if you're involved in a human subjects trial, the human subjects trial ha uh, experiments have to be approved by the institution of the review board. And in fact, every university and many times every hospital and very often every company uh, will have their own institutional review board and if multiple institutions are working together all of those institutional review boards have to approve that project. Now quite frankly especially if you're dealing with major medical universities in the United States the chances are if one university's IRB approves a project and that information is then forwarded to the other IRBs involved, that will certainly put those IRPs in a better disposition. But it is not a guarantee that they will approve it. They might say, we will approve it, but only if certain things that relate to our regulations. I'll give you an example. Until recently, um, in the state of New Jersey, they just changed this, but until recently in the state of New Jersey, it was illegal to do scientific experiments using prisoners. They've now repealed that law. So if, if I was collaborating with a university somewhere else where it was legal to do experiments with prisoners, I couldn't participate in that study because my IRB would never approve that because it was illegal. How could they approve it? So these, these are the things that you have to get involved in as you're doing collaborations. Again, the thing that comes out in all of this is that the best thing in every collaboration is as early as possible, hopefully before anything gets done, everyone should talk to everyone else and set up the ground rules for what's going to happen. Just over the break, I heard some stories from some of you about some of the things that have happened when that wasn't done. So um, some of you are acutely aware of this problem. Now, when we, we, we've talked about publishing papers, you've probably had other lectures on this subject. Uh, again, you want to publish because publishing papers is how you get recognized in science. Throughout your career, you can do all kinds of great stuff, but when it comes time for you to be evaluated, whether it be evaluated for promotion, for hiring, for getting a grant, the way they're going to evaluate you is by what you've published. So you're ready to publish, a piece of work when you can tell a complete story with reproducible data and a significant contribution. Now, technically, every author and contributor to a paper is responsible for that paper. So when you get your name on a paper, I know a lot of people say the most important thing, when I was a graduate student, actually, we had a wonderful thing in our department at Einstein. Uh, we had, a, in, my, in our department, we had one laboratory that only had students and postdocs in it. And the students and postdocs, in fact, came from three or four different labs. And so we were all together away from our advisors in a lab, just our own group. And it was a wonderful place because, you know, we would learn from other people's experiments because they would be doing totally different things than we were doing, but we'd be sharing a bench. Yeah. And it was also a great place for borrowing reagents because, you know, if you need a little phosphate buffer, you know, fellow at the next bench had it. And there used to be a joke when you say, you know, well, can I have some phos sodium phosphate buffer pH uh, 7.5, to which the answer would be third author. But, <laughs> but no, that is, not, that is not a criterion for authorship. Um, but the thing is, every author should have made a significant contribution to the work, but and you say, oh, that's good, you know, I'm, I'm on the paper, I get credit. But you not only get credit, but you get responsibility. So if a paper gets published and you are an author of that paper, you are, responsibili you are responsible for verifying that that work is really true and accurately and done correctly. Now, when I was a student, I gave about 30 seconds of thought to that. Because I said, gee, most of the papers I'm on only have two or three authors. In fact, most of those papers, I was the first author, and the second author was my advisor. And in fact, most of those papers 
at least 80% of the experiments were ones I had done with my own hands, and the other one, the other few were done by someone else who I was working with and saw them do the experiment. So to say that I was responsible for every experiment in the paper didn't worry me in the slightest, because I had seen everything in that paper done, and I knew it was right. What happens when you have a geneticist and a biochemist and a physician and an x-ray crystallographer and a biostatistician and their students all collaborating on a paper, as now very often happens? As a molecular geneticist, someone else may doing, be doing x-ray crystallography on a protein that I purified. I can't solve a Bragg equation. I, fortunately, from graduate school, know enough that I know what a Bragg equation is, but that's about the extent of my knowledge of x-ray crystallography. So we publish a paper, I'm an author, and there's an x-ray structure in that paper. What's gonna happen if someone says, I don't believe that structure? Dr. Leibowitz, can you explain that structure to me? I'm in big trouble. But hopefully, my x-ray crystallographer can explain that, although that person may have no idea how I purified this protein. Um, well, that's the problem with a problem with collaboration, is that now there may be a need to divide up responsibility. And one of the things that's happening because of that is that there's really a new initiative, which was really pioneered by the Journal of the American Medical Association, but is now done uh, by, by many journals, especially in the biomedical area where these huge and complex collaborations are becoming very much the rule, is that very often in a paper, they will want to identify the contribution of each collaborator, maybe not even just the authors, but even the people who are thanked in the acknowledgments, and say, okay, Here's this paper, the following three people did the x-ray crystallography. This person did the nuclear magnetic resonance. These people did the clinical trial. You know, this, per this person wrote the grant. You know, and that, you know, you, you, you'll see a long list there of who did what. And that, that, I think, is a very positive trend because now if a question comes up, uh, a reviewer or someone trying to repeat the experiment and is having a problem, if they look at this paper and say, oh, I know exactly who to call to see uh, what's going on with that particular experiment, rather than calling the wrong person. And that's, gonna, that's uh, again, a growing trend in collaborations. Okay, so let's uh, go over a case here. Um, Bob Powell, a postdoc fellow in biochemistry, has just completed a manuscript de detailing the results from the first project in which he had taken a leading role. The focus of his project has been to discern the ways in which humans metabolize sulfites, chemicals commonly used to preserve wines and dried fruits. Although he had developed the rough outlines of the project on his own, he owes much to individuals both inside and outside his lab. The assistance he received from others included the following. A colleague at another university, a toxicologist specializing in food additives, uh, shared with Bob his previous work on the in vivo activities of sulfites, information that allowed Bob to choose the ideal anim animal model, the Abyssinian field mouse. A friend of his, a wildlife specialist, provided much advice on rearing and maintaining a colony of these mice to provide a stable pool of subjects. Okay. Then, a highly experienced technician in the lab uh, gave Bob advice on modifying an assay he had been using, which finally allowed him to measure sulfite metabolites in mouse urine. This technician also assisted in writing up the methods section of the paper. The number of assays that Bob had to conduct was quite sizable, and more than he could manage on his own, given other demands of the project. A college student collected most of the urine samples and conducted the assays, yielding the data. And finally, a senior researcher in a neighboring lab who took an interest in Bob's career offered to review the initial drafts of Bob's paper. By the end of the writing process, this researcher had helped Bob outline the paper, suggested a few additional experiments that strengthened the paper's conclusions, and made a number of editing changes uh, in the penultimate draft that enhanced the paper's clarity. So let's go down this list and let's take some votes on, um, on, on whether we want to make each of these people um, 
uh, an author, someone who's cited in the acknowledgement, um, or um, someone who doesn't need any mention at all. Okay, so let's go to this first one, the colleague from the other universe, the toxicologist. Uh, would that be, how many people vote for an author? How many people vote for acknowledgement? How many vote for no mention at all? Um, I would probably be inclined, uh, well, but anyone, before I do, do that, what, what, anyone want to comment on that? I think in this case, I'd be inclined to say an acknowledgement. Um, I, I don't think, you know, that degree of involvement suggests authorship. But I think if a, yes? I guess that's possible. I guess um, I, I guess a lot would depend on how much um, how much conversation really went on. Um, I'm usually biased in favor of including people more than excluding people, in that I've never, well, not sure never, but rarely had anyone be angry uh, because of including someone on a paper. But I've certainly had people be angry about being excluded from papers. Um, and acknowledgments are, um, you know, I, th I think authorship has to meet certain criteria. Um, acknowledgments, I think, are, um, are really, um, if a person has made a contribution, I think it should be acknowledged. But I would agree that if, if this was really well-established work and it was already published, on the other hand, if, if there were also, you know, you know, I just recently was talking to someone about some long published work on a field I work on and uh, on culturing malaria organisms and this stuff was published a long time ago by other people, neither of us. And this person pointed out to me, oh yeah, you know, this is what's published but you got to do this and you got to do that and you got to do this and you got to do that. And in fact some cultures that I had in my lab that weren't growing now all of a sudden started growing when I did all those little things that this person told me. Now it's all ancient stuff. This is stuff published 20, 30 years ago, but um, you know our lab couldn't get this thing to work before we had this advice. And when you know when I write this stuff up, I'm going to thank that person for the advice they gave me. But it wasn't you know it wasn't nothing new and exciting. It was old and exciting, but uh, still I couldn't have done it without them. So uh, that's my judgment on that. Anyhow, how about the friend, the wildlife specialist who provided advice? on rearing and maintaining a colony of the mice. Uh, authorship, I would agree. Uh, acknowledgement, yeah, I think probably, or no, nothing at all. Yeah, I think you go either way on that, uh, but um, uh, uh, again, I, I'm biased a bit towards, towards inclusion, but here it becomes really a question. And also, if this person's a wildlife specialist, I think a lot would depend on what kind of career path they're in, whether they're in an academic situation where being mentioned on a paper might be a nice thing for them, or if they're in a kind of situation where, you know, uh, you know they're getting paid by, by some company to manage some, some piece of land or something, and, you know, they don't care if they get published or not, so maybe they don't even care about the acknowledgments. Um, now, how about the uh, technician? How many for authorship? Okay, how many for acknowledgement? Okay, how many for nothing? Glad to see that, okay, no one says that. Okay, I, I, I think a lot, you, a lot of you have, uh, have come to a conclusion that I have. Now, it's that maybe this should be authorship. Uh, it's very interesting, it kind of classically, in biomedical science, uh, the general, consensus is you don't have to put technicians on as authors on papers. You know, the technicians are, quote, a pair of hands. Um, well, maybe there are some technicians who are a pair of hands, but most of the best technicians I've known have had pretty good heads attached to those hands. And in fact, I had a wonderful technician in my lab. In fact, I think Dr. Martinez remember her, uh, Denise, who worked with me for, uh, for 18 years. And um, uh, Denise, you know, 
read the literature, modified protocols, made suggestions, uh, you know, played a major role in writing papers. And in fact, Denise was first author on three or four papers from my lab because, you know, she had that level of work. Uh, I have had other technicians where, quite frankly, they know were never author of a paper. They simply, you know, thanked so-and-so for excellent technical assistance because that person, you know, came in every morning, they pushed the button, the machine lit up, numbers came out, at the end of the day they turned it down, they cleaned it up. You know, well, that, that doesn't deserve authorship. But I would agree, someone who's actually writing sections of the paper, designing experiments, you know, that would be, that would be authorship. How about the college students? How many say authorship? Okay, how many say acknowledgement? Okay, so a few, not many. No one? How about nothing? Okay, I, I would agree with you. You, could, you folks, I think, are, you, you've obviously been thinking about this already. In general, um, I'd say, how about if this person wasn't a college student but was a part-time technician? How many would say authorship then? How many would say acknowledgement? Yeah, I see a change there. And I would agree with that. Uh, I would probably say if a person simply, you know, collected the samples, did the assays, probably didn't know enough at that point in their careers to really make a real contribution other than doing what they were told to do, um, well, that in general, I'd say that really doesn't deserve the compensation of being an author, and if they're getting paid for it, well, they're ahead of the game. That's really good. On the other hand, the college student is doing this for the purpose of learning and for the purpose of advancing their career. And so, again, I have a kind of a bias here, but I think it's a correct one, but of course you're welcome to disagree with me. But I feel for a college student, my standards for authorship go down a little bit in that uh, uh, a college student, I would make an author quicker than I would a technician, because that's, that student is specifically there because they want authorship, uh, and uh, they might, you know, they could make more working at Burger King, but they're coming to my lab because they're hoping they can do something better with their lives, and I want to encourage them to do that. How about the, uh, the senior researcher who helped? How many say authorship? Okay, how many say acknowledgement? How many say nothing? Okay, interesting. Uh, I'd say that this is a problematic one. Fortunately, probably not very problematic to the person involved. This person is already a senior researcher. Uh, you know, that person probably doesn't need the authorship the way a college student would. You know, a college student may have no other opportunity to be an author. This person, you know, already has tenure, already has grant support, has written a lot of papers, whether or not they're cited or made an author is no big deal to them. So I would say that person probably shouldn't be an author. The only thing that might bias uh, Bob to make that person an author is maybe if that person is really very famous, would it be good to include them so maybe then people will say, oh, look, that paper came from a good lab. Maybe we should accept that paper because that person has a good track record. On the other hand, is that really honest? And maybe that's bad for Bob, because, you know, Bob, when he publishes this work, is going to want to say, look, this is my work. And if this other person who is much more senior is on the paper, then that person may say, oh, you know, maybe Bob really didn't do much more than act as a technician in this project, that maybe the senior author is really the person who thought of this whole thing, which is not the case. So I think in this case, I would probably be be inclined to maybe uh, include it in the acknowledge but not make it authorship. But again, there, there's, there's some room here to think about that. And of course, whatever Bob decides, presumably should talk about uh, with his thesis advisor, since the thesis advisor uh, may also have uh, some, or postdoc advisor, I guess he's a postdoc, because that person whose lab this is done in presumably also has some strong opinions and probably also was an author on the paper. Okay, anything else we want to talk about on this uh, case? Okay. Um, okay, let's uh, let see what else we have here. Oh, here's a, a case. This is, um, again, an issue for collaboration. 
Uh, Dr. Jonathan Perry, a tenured professor, used his sabbatical to visit the laboratory of Dr. Brian Chandler, a widely published and respected senior scientist. During his stay in Dr. Chandler's lab, Dr. Perry hoped to learn certain techniques of molecular biology that he would employ in his own research. To afford Dr. Perry this opportunity, Dr. Chandler assigned him a leading role in a new project that the lab was undertaking. After seven months, the laboratory work on the project was completed, and Dr. Perry returned to his own institution to begin work on a paper to report the final results. Ultimately, many drafts of the paper were faxed back and forth. You can tell this is an old case. Now no one would fax papers back and forth. Um, uh, uh, until Dr. Perry received the penultimate version uh, from Dr. Chandler's lab. On this new version, a new name, J.B. Martin, PhD, appeared among the authors listed. Dr. Perry had never met Dr. Martin, never worked with him on any technical aspect of the project, and had never heard his name or ideas mentioned in the laboratory meetings uh, when the, in which the project was planned or the results discussed. Dr. Perry called Dr. Chandler and questioned the addition of Dr. Martin as an author on the manuscript. Dr. Chandler stated that due to prior collaborations, it was a long-standing policy to include Dr. Martin on all publications coming out of Dr. Chandler's laboratory. Dr. Martin's laboratory had a reciprocal agreement, he added. Dr. Perry stated that he did not feel that Dr. Martin was a qualified author of this particular paper, since he had not made a significant contribution to the work being published. Dr. Chandler replied that Dr. Perry did not have the right to question the policy of a laboratory in which he had worked as an invited guest. Dr. Perry maintained his position that Dr. Martin did not belong as an author on the paper and further stated that if Dr. Chandler insisted on including Dr. Martin's name, then his first author, Dr. Perry, would not allow the paper to be submitted. Dr. Chandler responded, well, you can withdraw your name, but the work was done here in my laboratory and we plan on submitting the paper for publication. Ah, see, he looks so hard. <laughs> So what do you think of the reciprocal agreement between these two, between doc, these two laboratories? Hey, it's a great idea. You know, I put both my, my name on your papers, you put your name on my papers. We all have twice as many papers. I mean, what a, that's good, right? We all want papers. Think that sounds like a good idea? Something sounds bad about it, right? I mean, for one thing, I'd be very nervous about that. I mean, I, I don't want to be responsible for other papers. I'll tell you a true story. It happened to me. I had a uh, bright young uh, assistant professor from Mexico who came to my lab and worked for a couple of years uh, as an exchange professor. And he was a clinician, but he came to work on some basic molecular biology on some infectious disease, on, on pneumocystis that we were working on at the time. And um, he did very nice work. Uh, it really didn't result in a full-length publication. But we got a couple of interesting abstracts out. And afterwards, you know, having had this experience, he went back to Mexico and continued his work there at his university. And about a year later, he sent me um, uh, a draft of a paper. And he said, you know, I had this interesting case. Um, it happened to be a case of a fungal infection that he was reporting in the scientific literature. And he said, uh, He'd be honored if um, I would um, include my name as an author on this case when he reported it. So I looked it over and I wrote back to him the same day and I said, uh, very interesting paper, but please do not include my name on this paper. Because I don't, I never met this patient, I never saw this data, I, I do not deserve authorship, nor do I want to have the responsibility if there turns out to be anything wrong with this paper. I don't, I don't want it. On the other hand, I had another situation where I had another former student of mine who, um, uh, some of you remember, from, who was from China, and who happened to be a very good student, but whose English language skills were not as good as many of my students have been. And uh, she was already in China as a professor there, and she sent me a paper and she said, I really would appreciate it if you look over this paper. And I looked over the paper and I made, a, you know, three changes per sentence in the English, which is some, the way she and I interact when I review her papers. But I also found that the whole paper revolved around one structural study and I really felt that this structural study had to be modified or the paper would not be acceptable. And I, I recommended that a totally different approach 
be taken in that particular uh, study of the structure of this three-dimensional structure of this RNA molecule. Well, um, it turned out that she uh, took my advice to heart, and they totally revised their approach, and they did the new approach, and, uh, and in fact, they kept sending data back and forth to me, and we, um, I helped them rework this several times. And uh, then when she eventually sent me a draft of the paper again, and this time my name appeared as an author. I mean, not first author, I was you know, sixth or seventh author, but I was in the list. And at first I, I, I wrote back to her and I said, you know, I don't really think I should be an author of this because I didn't do the work. And she argued with me and she said, you know, we wouldn't have done this experiment had you not suggested it and we wouldn't have been able to express it the way we did without your corrections in the way we did it. So I want you to be an author and you've been intimately involved in the project. And that time I accepted. She, she made the case to me. But my attitude was I had to be convinced uh, to be an author. Uh, so anyhow, I don't like this arrangement at all. Um, but it puts really, you know, when you get faced with something like this again, it puts Dr. Perry in a very awkward position because like Dr. Mar like, like uh, Dr. Chandler said, he was the guest in his laboratory and that's the way they did things there. Now, I don't think it's a good system, but um, it's, you know, that's, this is one of the problems, again, with authorship. A lot of people say, well, the real final decision on authorship can never really be made until the paper is finished. Because, you know, very often you might decide, well, these three people are writing this paper, but, you know, one of them really never does anything, and then someone else who you didn't even know about comes in and does a major contribution. So authorship can change during the course of developing a piece of work. But on the other hand, um, it's a, still a very good idea to at least have a ground plan. Who is going to be an author on this paper? It would be much easier to have this conversation at the beginning than at the end of this collaboration. Uh, and it really is a problem. So, um, so what do you think about Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Perry? Uh, do you think Dr. Perry should give up authorship on his pay first authorship on the paper because he doesn't want Dr. Martin's name on it? How many people say yes, he should give up the authorship? How many people say no? Well, I, must, I hate to admit, but I agree with you. Uh, I mean, in the ideal world, you might say, stand up for your principles. But again, um, uh, in a less than ideal world, you have to deal with reality. And, you know, uh, one extra name on a paper is not a good thing, but doing over a year of work, doing the research, and then doing the paper writing afterwards and not getting credit for it uh, is also not a good thing. And um, sometimes you have to make compromises. But, uh, but there's something that troubles me about it, I must admit. And I can understand Dr. Perry's concerns. And I'm, uh, when, I, when I vote the way you voted, I'm not happy about it. But, but it's something that, um, you know, sometimes you have to make compromises. But it's important to know you're making the compromises. Okay, any comments, any further comments on that before we go on? Okay. Now, again, one thing in collaborations, remember, is that, you know, there is a, the order of authors on a paper can be important. Now, in the biomedical sciences, generally, the first author is the person who's made the greatest contribution to the paper, usually the graduate student or postdoc. Uh, the only exception to that may be, maybe in a review paper, maybe the PI would be the first author, because maybe in that paper the PI actually did most of the work on the paper. Usually on a, on a, on a, on a laboratory paper, most of the work on the paper is done not by the PI. Uh, at least not, m most PIs spend more of their time writing grants and writing papers than they do doing lab work, unfortunately. Um, and then usually the last author is the PI, uh, assuming the PI was involved in the project, which they usually are. Uh, I've seen a few cases where a PI won't put their name on a paper because in fact, the project was entirely done by other people in the lab and the, P and the PI wasn't involved, but usually the PI is involved. 
Uh, and then usually the other people are listed in order of contribution. So maybe the senior student is the first author, then the slightly more junior student would be the second author, maybe a, a very actively involved technician might be the third author, uh, maybe the, the two college students who worked last summer will be the fourth and fifth authors, and then the PI would be the last author. That's kind of a typical story for a paper. Um, but of course, the numbers may be very large. Now, you don't have too many people who get into fights saying, well, you know, I'm fifth author, I really want to be fourth author. Because, you know, there's not much at stake. I mean, no one cares. But on the other hand, there's a lot at stake when it comes to being first author. Because when this paper gets cited, it's going to be cited as Smith et al. And if Jones is the second author, uh, Jones won't have that to their credit. Now, very often what you'll now see is dual first author papers. So you'll see Smith, Jones, and all these other people, and there'll be a little asterisk next to Smith and Jones. And on the, there'll be a footnote that says, these authors made equal contribution to this work. And um, that would, um, and that's perfectly fair, but it'll still be Smith et al. when it gets cited. Now I'll tell you a true story. A chairman in my school contacted me and said, you know, I have two students who were co-authors on a paper, Smith and Jones, uh, let's say, and Jones is applying for an assistant professorship now. Uh, since it's said on the paper uh, that Smith and Jones made equal contributions, on her CV, could Jones list the paper as Jones et al. since they made equal contributions? So what do you think? How many people think that's, that's okay? Right, they made equal contributions. How many think it's not okay? I see a, a, a great wealth of non-response there. <laughs> It could be. That could be. It would be perfectly all right, but most journals tell you how they want it cited. So even if you write it that way, usually the journal typesetter will, will change it. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I, I consulted with a few people and uh, unambiguously responded to the chairman that it would be a disastrous thing for Jones to do that on her CV because Anyone looking at that CV and then going looking to find the paper would say, this is an example of falsification. And if this person has falsified something like authorship, might they have also falsified other things and perhaps we don't want to hire this person to be on our faculty. So my advice was don't do it. So. Um, that, that, I, I would say if you're ever put in that situation, you're certainly welcome to write in your covering letter, uh, you know, first author of five papers, including one which was dual first authorship, but don't change the order of names on that publication. If it was published that way, you know, just be tough and, and live with it. Don't, don't try changing it. Bad thing. And again, another important thing about authorship um, is it's best to decide early, but of course things can change. And all authors, generally when you submit a paper, you actually have to sign. Now, a few journals will actually, I've had this happen to me a few times, when I've submitted a paper it says, here is a form, we want every author on this paper to sign to say that they have seen this paper. And I tell you the truth, as much as sometimes it's a real pain, because sometimes one of those authors is a student who graduated six months ago, and I've got to go find them to get them to sign it. But I really like that system, because you know when, I, when that happens, I know that there's no shortcuts being taken. But in most journals, don't have that system. 
But still, when I submit a, uh, to most journals, it says, in submitting this paper, the corresponding author, which means usually either the, the first author or the PI, agrees and signs here to say that all authors and contributors have reviewed and approved this document before submission. Because you don't want to have your name on a paper that goes in and afterwards you're reading it and you realize, oh my God, these guys got it all wrong and my name is stuck on that thing. Right? That's not good. So as much as it's nice to be on a paper, you don't want it there unless you're prepared to stand behind it. So again, everyone's in a rush. We want to meet the deadline. We want to get the paper out before the grant gets submitted or before the patent gets submitted or, you know, or after the patent gets submitted, but not too long after or before we go up for that promotion or go for that job. But you always want to get all authors involved. Now, another place where collaborations become important, and these will be important to all of you since you're all working with other people, um, is in talks and presentations. It's very important to cite prior work, the sources of any materials, the contribution of others, and not just the list of names of the end. You've all seen talks where the talk goes on and on and on, and there's all this beautiful data, and at the end there's the very last slide with this list of names and very tiny lettering it says, and these guys help me. You know? Well, that's, that's okay, but it's really not right. It's really the best way to do that is as the talk is going on, if people, if some of that work you're presenting is really done by other people, and it often is, um, it's very important to make that perfectly clear to the audience. It's only fair to the investigators, and it's also only fair to the audience. I can tell you a true story. We once had a, um, a, 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 a recruitment of a new assistant professor in our department. And uh, uh, I drew the short straw and became one of the members of that recruitment committee. And we put an ad in science. We got about 150 applicants, all of whom looked pretty good. They all had PhDs and lots of papers and all that good stuff, nice letters of recommendation. But just before this search, a virologist at another university had done some major work on doing in vitro assembly of a virus, which hadn't been done before for that particular virus. It was a very important virus in public health. And this person was a postdoctoral fellow in that lab. And in fact, we had previously tried to recruit that lab chief to be the chairman of our department a few years earlier. And now this postdoc from that department was from that lab was applying for our job. And we were thrilled. That was the very first person we invited to come interview for that job. And that postdoc came in with four or five papers on this very important work and presented a masterful presentation of the assembly of this virus that came out of a laboratory with about 20 people in it, about two thirds of whom at least had PhDs already. And that presentation was presented as if it were the work of that one candidate himself. And after that seminar, a group of faculty were supposed to have lunch with the candidate. But all of them found something else they had to do then. And I wound up, as a member of the search committee, having to have lunch with the candidate myself and no one else wanted to join us. Needless to say, that candidate did not get an offer. So it, you do not help your case by slighting your colleagues, especially if you're dealing with future colleagues. So here's a case. Um, Hal Strock was finishing the last year of his immunology postdoctoral fellowship in the laboratory of Professor Schwartz. Over time, he had evolved from a veritable apprentice into a productive contributor to the progress of the laboratory. One day, Hal was asked to give a presentation of his work at a department seminar. When offered an opportunity to rehearse, Hal indicated that he believed he was fully prepared. And I must admit, this, you know, that, that's a, maybe a mistake, but you know, I'm, as a faculty member, I'm very busy. I always ask my students and postdocs if they're getting ready for a talk, if they want to practice. 
And if they say, no, I'm all ready, I've got things to do with that hour. I don't have to listen to their talk, so I, I kind of like that, but that's a potential problem. Anyhow, during the seminar, Hal reviewed the main research progress of Professor Schwartz's laboratory, including his own contributions. The work was enthusiastically received by those outside Hal's lab, and he fielded the questions very well. However, Hal's co-investigators and other lab members who were all in attendance were strangely quiet afterwards. Over the course of the following week, Hal experienced aloofness from Professor Schwartz and hostility from other lab members, especially when he asked them about his performance at the presentation. Hal decided to ask Professor Schwartz what was wrong. Professor Schwartz said, Hal, you failed to delineate your limited contribution to the material uh, in your presentation, and you did not give full credit to those in this laboratory and to others that did most of the work. Not only have you upset your colleagues, some might say that your negligence constitutes plagiarism. Your colleagues take as much pride as you do in their professional accomplishments and have as much need for recognition. You will have a hard time regaining their trust. Chastened, Hal made an effort to apologize to all of his colleagues. So I think here you see the kind of problem you can get into. Uh, you know, when you're, when you're giving a seminar, you're reporting research, and you have to give adequate credit. It's just like writing a paper or writing a grant. You're communicating science. You, want to, you have to give recognition. So, um, but, but here again, as indicated in the last sentence, you know, Professor Schwartz, in a way, was responsible too, right? He should have prepared Hal for this. He was his advisor. He was giving his first talk on his research. But it's easy, you know, it's easy to, for these things to slip between the cracks when everyone's busy and pushed for time. Okay, well, that brings us to the, the end of the presentation, but uh, thank you very much.